Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Shane, keeping me right. Welcome to a Father's Day service and happy Father's Day to the dads that are here today. Dickie's just told me that there's loads of rolls and bacon left over, so please take that home for lunch. If, uh, if the kids haven't sorted out lunch for dad, then uh, dad can have bacon rolls for lunch. Now, speaking of the kids sorting things out, Stuart showed me a photo this morning of the, the breakfast that he had. So Stuart woke up this morning and between Bree and Brooke and I think Jaden had assisted, they have made him, Stuart will show you the photo, they have made him this banquet, it's like a king's table of croissants and fruits and amazing things for Father's Day breakfast. It looks, the presentation's amazing and it looks, it looks so good to eat. And I was reflecting on what I had for breakfast which was a 7-Eleven muffin on the way to the meeting. So, Brother Stuart, you're a blessed beyond measure to have uh, such care to have this, uh, this feast that was brought before you. So I trust that somewhere between Stuart's feast and my muffin, the dads have all been looked after this morning. Okay, we're going to start with uh, a couple of um, dad jokes, as you would for Father's Day. So the first joke is, who was the smallest person in the Bible? Any, any ideas? Zacchaeus. Well, probably. But the joke says it was Nehemiah. <laughs> really? That's the best you can do? Well, this is another one. What kind of person was Boaz before he got married? Hey, how good are you? Very good. Huh? Very good. All right. Last one, I'll put you out of your misery, is need to build an ark. What comes next? Need to build it. Keep going. I know a guy. Huh? All right. No more dad jokes. That's it. And... Uh, Sure you're glad to be done. But let's sing this one together, How Deep the Father's Love.
Okay, quiz. Can you assist me, Joel? Thank you. So Joel's got, he's in charge of the lollies. He's been guarding these lollies very, very carefully all morning. Did anyone pinch any? Anyone pinch any? He did. <laughs> all right. All right. Let it be noted that the witness has pointed to Ebenezer as the thief of the lollies. Nobody else pinched any? And he did. All right. All right. So, and I did. <laughs> hey, what I'm hearing is that you're an unreliable witness. All right. So if you get an answer right, uh, Joel, in his absolute discretion and authority, will give you a lolly if he deems you deserve it. Okay. Question number one. Which father came to Jesus to save his daughter? Look for their hands up. Yeah. Jairus, excellent. Very good. Are you going to give her a lolly or are you just going to stand there? <laughs> no? No? Okay, very good. Well done, Carol. Question number two. What was the name of the father of King Saul? Father of King Saul. Come on, someone. Yeah, correct. Kish, yeah. yeah. Uncle Sid. Hang on, no, no, don't give to Uncle Sid. Joel, don't give to Uncle Sid because already Ebenezer has stolen from his family. So, no, no, this, will, this will teach the father to teach the child about not stealing, see? So, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Question three, what was the commitment that Joshua made in Joshua 24 and 15? He made a commitment. What was it? Uncle Bobby? I and my family will serve the Lord. Right, very good. Did any of his family steal lollies from you? <laughs> Uncle Bobby's family, were they all honest or did they steal? No. I think you better give, give to Uncle Bobby. Go, go. Thank you. Question four, what does Psalm 127 and 5 say about a man with many children? And it isn't many frustrations or many headaches. But that verse says something about a father with many children. Any ideas? Uncle Bobby, you're going to get toothache. What is it? Uh, around the olive tree. Around the olive tree? Yeah. No. That's right. It says the man that has many children, a full quiver, is blessed or happy is the man. Uncle Atef. Joel? Give, uh, his daughter stole one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. All right. And question number five if a son asks for bread, what will a father not give? Uncle Sijin. Uh, no? No. Stone. Stone, yes. Yes, okay. Uncle David. It goes on to speak about the snake, but the uh, specific is the. Uh, if he asks for bread, he won't be given a stone. So if he asks for a fish, he won't be given a snake. Okay, well done, very good. Okay, let's sing this Abba Father. Uh, I think it's number four, the song. Abba Father, let me be yours and yours alone. Have a seat for now, you come back up later on.
volunteers and some conscripts. Uncle Atef and Maged, uh, Uncle Andrew and Sean, and Uncle Roy and Lizzie. Could you come up for us now? So we're going to play a little game. We played this at Mother's Day, and if you remember, Auntie Tina was, uh, was very interesting. Auntie Tina's not with us today, so Atef, Roy or Andrew, one of you has to play Auntie Tina's role. Come up. So I'm just going to ask you a series of questions. You'll stand back to back. Father and son, father and daughter, stand back to back. And as the question, as the question comes up... Uh, uh, we, I think we know who Annie Tina's going to be. Huh? All right. So as the questions come up, Andrew, this is the part where you raise your hand. So if, if you are more likely to be the person of the two of you, then you raise your hand. If you're not, you keep your hand down. Okay. So the first one is who is better looking? Okay. Andrew and Sean would need an answer. The, uh, so they're either, they're either both ugly or they're both humble. Okay, who, who would stand up better in a crisis? All right, and the third one's there as well. Who has the better fashion sense? <laughs> Are you sure, Sean? Yeah, better. Right. Have you seen your father's uh, Grand Prix tops that he wears? You still, you still think? Okay. Did you see his apron? <laughs> Who could eat more at McDonald's? <laughs> All right. Who would change a tyre quickest? Who's more scared of spiders? <laughs> no, Maged, you're uh, not. Neither of you are owning up to that one. Okay. Who's funnier? <laughs> Who would win a game of tennis? Who can sing better? <laughs> Who's more likely to get a spitting ticket? I hope, I hope that's your hand up, Roy. It'd be a problem with your hand, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> Who can spell more better? More better. 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 That's a compliment, Maggie. He says you're good in the spelling. Everything else you're rubbish at, but you're good in the spelling. And the last one, who has more friends? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Well done. I think Tina still retains her title. So. Okay, let's sing this one. 52, God sent his son.
leave it there. Okay, Brother Bobby, could you please open a prayer for us? Thank you. Okay, part two of our quiz. You ready, Joel? Come back up. More lollies? So our first question is, how did the prodigal son's father react when he came home? Abby? Yeah, he was. You're really happy. Very good. Yeah. You can give to him because his father's already repaid the debt. <laughs> Or maybe you should give to his father now. Okay, number two. Which father had the son that lived the longest? Father had the son that lived the longest. Abraham. Not Abraham. Lamech. Not Lamech. <laughs> Methuselah was the one that lived the longest. So it's the father. The father of Methuselah is who we're after? Enoch. That's right. Yeah. Enoch is correct. Okay, Auntie Jessie? <laughs> uh, which father does the Bible record as having the most children? No. No, it's not Job. There's probably a father that had more children, or several. Solomon probably had more, and Gideon probably had more. But Bible records specifically, because it speaks about this man's daughters and sons, often just sons. So because of that, this is the man that's recorded as having the most children. No. Yeah. 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 No takers. I'm going to get the chocolate here, Joel. 24 sons. Is it 24 sons? No, it is not. It is, he had 60 daughters and he had 28 sons. So 88. Who do you think? No. It's Rehoboam. So Rehoboam is the man. Thank you, mate. I'll have one of those. I don't like yellow ones. All right, so Rehoboam is the man that's recorded as having the most, son, the most uh, children. Others, thanks, mate. Others probably have more, but he's the one that's recorded. Okay, question four. At what age did Methuselah become a father? 
At what age did he become a father? Imagine this. Uh, 100 and... No, he was older than that. No, less than 300. 100 and... You're getting closer. They're just guessing, aren't they? Another one for me, Joel. He was uh, 187. You imagine becoming a father at 187. Nikki? I'm, uh, I'm nowhere near 187. According to Matthew 7 and 11, what will our Heavenly Father give to those that ask Him? No. Bobby's hand sort of half up. No. Well, he will do those things, but according to this verse, he will give another one for me, Joel. He will give good things. It's all right. He will give good things. Okay, well done. Thank you, Joel. You take a couple for yourself, mate. And uh, thank you for your work. Okay. Uh, brother, always. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Joel. If you, um, if you look in Google or YouTube for The Greatest Father, there is a video clip and a story that comes up about uh, a father whose name was uh, Dick Hoyt and his son is Rick. And Who's heard of them before? Hands up if you've heard of Dick and Rick. Yeah, okay. So th this is a, a bronze statue that's been erected just before the start of the Boston Marathon. Because these two together completed in over 30 Boston marathons. So at the start of this iconic marathon, there is this statue of a father and a son. And it speaks to the relationship that they, they had. When, uh, when Rick, the son, was born, he was born with cerebral palsy. And the, the doctors in the hospital at the time said, don't even take him home. Just put him in an institution. That's the place for him. And don't bother bringing him into your home as your son, but leave him in the institution. But Dick and his wife, uh, Rick's mum, said, no, we'll bring him home. And they were determined that they would raise him in their home as any other child. They had other children, and they would raise him as, as they would any other child. And as he got a little older, they realised that there was an intelligence in him that confounded the medical professionals. And they developed a computer that enabled him to communicate and to speak. Now, the end of it was that Rick ended up graduating from college. And he ended up working as a computer programmer and developing machines that would help people with similar disabilities to him. But these two, between them, they, they ran over a thousand events. And we're going to play a little video. It's really grainy. But I'll give you a bit of an idea of what they did. And the, the thing I want you to focus on as you watch this just for a few minutes is the relationship between the father and the son. And look and see the lengths that the father goes to for the son. So have that in your mind. Think about the relationship between the father and the son.
<laughs> Pretty impressive, funny, right? You see the dad, you see the clip there where he can hardly walk and he's just holding himself. up as he as he moves along and he's pushing his son behind him and you see him with the son in the the little boat little dinghy and he's swimming he's carrying both himself and his and his son so they began running these races together when uh, the son heard about a fundraiser for another child who had been injured and disabled and he spoke to his dad he said dad you know can we not help can we not do this together and raise money and they began uh, that way, and they contributed to it. Now they, together, they did 257 triathlons. They did six Ironman, 72 marathons. Done a little bit of running, Silas. Look at the, what these guys have done. And in, in all, they did 1,130 events in total. But I think the thing that's most impressive about it is the relationship between them. And the son, there's other clips you can see of the son, and, and he's, he's able to communicate through his computer, and he says things like, when I'm with my dad and we're running, he said, I feel like the disability's gone. And that's what the relationship was for these two, is that they were so close through what it was that they, that they did. So when I look at this, and I, I love their story, and when I see that Google describes this guy as the greatest father, it was hard to argue when you look at the sacrifice that he has and the relationship that he has with his son, how special it is and what he is prepared to do. But I want to just think about another relationship between a father and a son. And just to bring before you four or five verses that speak about the one that really is the greatest father. Now, when Mahesh prayed for the food today and uh, when Brother Bobby has prayed to open up, they've both spoken about the relationship and the, and the wonder it is that God is our father or can be our father. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14 is, is one of my favourite verses and it amazes me because it says that the father sent the son to be the saviour of the world. Now, you think of all the things that the father could have sent the son to do. The Father could have sent the Son to judge the world. The Father could have sent the world to sort the world out and to tell the world how wrong it was. The Father could have sent the world to, to get back at the world for all the things the world had done to him. It doesn't say any of that. It says so simply, it says that the Father sent the Son to be the saviour of the world. This is the relationship that the Father and the Son have and yet the Father would send the Son to be the saviour of the world. And when the Son did come, and the Lord Jesus Christ came into this scene of time, he would say, when he was just a boy, just a boy of around 12, he would say to his earthly parents, to Mary and to Joseph, when they go looking for him, he said, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? It's an important point here because Mary says to Jesus, he says, did you not know that, that, that myself and your father were worried? And the Lord Jesus makes it really clear and he says, no, he said, Joseph isn't my father, earthly father, respected and caring for me in the home. But he said, I was about my father's business. And the Lord Jesus Christ, his father was God. And that's a really important distinction. He had no earthly father. Joseph raised and cared for him, but he was the son of God. And, and God declared that on several occasions. But here in Matthew chapter 3, and verse 17, this is the relationship between the father and the son. When the father says of the son, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now we've thought before about this, that, that there are fathers here that are fortunate enough to be able to say that in our children, we are mostly pleased. And we go through and we reflect on their life at different times. Maybe they turn 18, maybe they get married and you reflect on their life and you're able to largely say that they have pleased you by God's grace. But this is God. This is a holy God who surveys all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done here on earth. And he says, I am well pleased. Not a little bit pleased. Not those things that I have to sweep under the carpet and forget about. 
There's absolutely nothing. But God declares, he says, this is my son. And in him I am well pleased. What pleases God's perfection? The Lord Jesus Christ is not only the son of God, but he is sinless and he is perfect. The Lord speaks of this relationship in John chapter 17, where in this passage, he's largely speaking about others and he is speaking about those that are being left and even extending to us today into this passage. But he speaks specifically and he says of the father, he says, you have loved me. You see the relationship, the father has loved the son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased about my father's business. God, the father has loved the son. At the end of the time on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ is paying for a sin that could never have been his. Remember, we've thought already about this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's no fault in him. There's no sin in him. But the Lord Jesus Christ has had my iniquity and he has had your iniquity and it's been laid upon him. And at the end of all of that, at the end of the Lord Jesus Christ paying the price for, for, for my wrong and for your wrong, he confidently says, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Do you see this relationship? The confidence that the Lord Jesus Christ has to say, Father, I know that the work that you gave me to do, I finished it. Everything that's been given me, it's been finished. And he is confidently able to say that into his Father's hands he commends his spirit. And the final verse is in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says there of God the Father who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this scene and he died. He really died. And he didn't die for his own sin. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. And God was satisfied with the price that he paid. And we know God was satisfied because he raised him from the dead. The relationship between the father and the son. And he raised him from the dead. The question that I want to leave you with, simply, simple message this morning, is just to ask you, is he your father? Yeah, we've sung Abba Father. The most beautiful, endearing term for a father. Abba Father. My father. My own unique father. The one with whom I have this close, intimate relationship. Abba Father. Is that what God is to you? Is he a father? Or don't you call him that? Because you can't call him that. Because to you he's far off. And you haven't got that relationship. You know, if we were to go to that Boston Marathon site and we were to see that statue, I'd love to see that. I'd love to read about it. And just to see it and to enter into the relationship between the father and the son. But I'm observing it from a distance. He's not my father. And I wasn't his son. So there isn't an intimacy. There is an interest. But there's not a relationship. Are you a bit like that with God? Where you can observe it from a distance. You can maybe even see merit in it. And you can have this understanding of who God is. But he is God. He's not your father. Think what he's done for you. And he could show you no greater love. The father sent the son. This is how he loves you. And how do you know he loves you? He sent his son to be the saviour of the world. He didn't give just anything. He didn't give just anyone. He gave his son. The one he loves. You have loved me. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he gave him for you. Is he your father? Young people that are here today, is he your father? As you think of Father's Day, great to have an earthly father. And it's great to have not just fathers, but it's great to have men that we can look to and see God's faithfulness in them. But do you know to have a heavenly father? To have a heavenly father is to have a home in heaven. To have a heavenly father is to have sins forgiven. To have a heavenly father is to have peace with God. Do you have your sins forgiven? Do you have a home in heaven? And do you have peace with God? Is he your father? Just before we uh, sing one last hymn and give out some cookies to dads, let's just pray. 
But Father, we thank you for examples that we can see around us of relationships between fathers and children. And our Father, we're the beneficiaries of that today as we have experienced in our lives and in those around us, we have experienced and seen the warmth of fathers and children. But our Father, we think of the relationship that you would have with your son. We think that he would be the one that would be ever your delight, the one in whom was no error, there never could be, and this one of whom you would be able to say, this is my beloved son. Father, we give thanks for the love of the father to the son. And yet, O oh Father, we thank you that even despite this love for the son and the sinlessness of the son, is that you would be prepared to send him into this world, not to be a judge, not to be a ruler or to be a king, but you would send him into this world that he would be the saviour of the world. And our Father, we thank you for every person that is here this morning that is able to say, my Father. But our Father, for any that are not yet able to do that, for any for whom there is no relationship, for whom you might be God, you might be known about, you might be understood a little, but you are not known in that intimate way as their Father. Father, we pray for them. We ask that you would speak unto them and reveal thy great love and reveal their need of a saviour. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's just sing one last hymn together. My Lord, what love is this that pays so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go free.